All right. Maranatha. Maranatha. Hmm. People seem off of that. We'll be talking about that. Maranatha means Christ is coming. So if you're excited about that, if you're excited about the return of Jesus Christ, when I say Maranatha, I want you to enthusiastically say Christ is coming. Is everybody with me? Let's practice. Maranatha. Amen. Say it as you really desired it. Unveiling revelation, your life is about to change forever. Amen? It's impossible that you come and that you study the things that we are going to be studying through the book of Revelation and that your life will stay the same. It is impossible. And we're going to be seeing some of that today. Amen? Now remember, we have our gifts for when you come to seven presentations, you will receive the first DVD, which is The Cosmic Conflict, The Origin of Evil, which interestingly has to do with the topic tonight. When you come to 14 presentations, you'll receive the second gift, which is another DVD from Amazing Facts, The Final Events of Bible Prophecy. Amen? Excited about that? Yes? Amen. All right, let's look at some of the topics. Tomorrow we're going to touch on the topic, The Slayed Lamb of Revelation. Tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Now, I've told you yesterday, I mentioned, if you've been raised in a Christian home, right, because nobody's born a Christian, if you've been raised in a Christian home your whole life, I promise you that tomorrow we are going to look at the life of Jesus Christ as you've, as you've never seen it before. You are going to be blown away with what we're going to study. We're going to look at a number of different prophecies related to Jesus Christ, prophecies that most people are unaware of, but they're right there in the Bible. Amen. So tomorrow, if there was one presentation that I did not, I would not want you to miss, it would be tomorrow's presentation. Tomorrow is probably the most important of all presentations, amen? But I'm glad you're here tonight. Praise the Lord. Tomorrow, that's tomorrow. Then Monday, what's the topic? Revelations 144,000 and the nation of Israel. We're going to jump into Revelation chapter 7 and we're going to study what is going on with those 144,000 and what about the nation of Israel? Are the prophecies in Revelation directly related to the nation of Israel as we know in the Middle East and a number of other things? And you're going to be blown away. We're going to look at a prophecy. It's called the 70-week prophecy. One of my favorite prophecies in the Bible. And we're going to see what exactly God's plan has for his people. So to Monday is going to be a fascinating topic. And then Tuesday, whoa, whoa, the ascension of Christ and the seven seals of Revelation. I mentioned to you yesterday that we are going to study what happened in heaven before, during, and after the ascension of Jesus Christ? Ooh. I hope some of you are going to be jumping out of your seat on Tuesday because this is fascinating stuff. What happened in heaven when Christ entered and what is Christ doing, right? Is Jesus Christ sitting on a holy hammock, just drinking a virgin pina colada, waiting for the time to show up and then come and... No, no, no. Christ is doing a fascinating work. On Tuesday, we're going to start and we're going to look at the inauguration or the dedication of the heavenly sanctuary and what, it has that, what relevance that has to us in our lives today. Amen? And then Wednesday, another fascinating topic. What is it? Revelation's secret rapture. Everybody in Christianity seems to be caught up with this secret rapture, right? And the question is, is the return of Jesus Christ, is the second coming of Jesus Christ a secret rapture or a glorious rapture. Woo! We're going to study the Bible and the Bible, and we're going to see what's behind this secret rapture. What's this be between the thief and the night? And we're going to let the Bible, not me, right? This has nothing to do with me. This has all to do with Scripture and God, and let God show us what is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Is everybody with me? Fascinating stuff. So I know everybody here knows somebody, maybe you do, that knows about the secret rapture. You have to invite them because we're going to have a fabulous, fabulous time. And Amazing Facts tonight presents the dragon and the beast of Revelation. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day of life. We thank you for your continual blessings and guiding and how your patience and mercy shows with us, especially through tonight's topic. We ask, Father, that as we are here, that your Holy Spirit may guide us to not only an understanding of your word, but to a keeping of it, a living by your word, Father. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the honor that we have to come here together and study your word and raise your name up high. And we ask this, Father, that you be with us, that your angels and your Holy Spirit guide us. And we ask this and we beg this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 to 8. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. 
But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, and these are the end of sorrows. Oh, no. These are the beginning of sorrows. When you start to look, I so the question we are going to answer today is, if God is a God of love, and if God is all-powerful, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? Amen? We see it consistently. We see wars, rumors of wars consistently all over the place. We see death on every place, even in our country. Consistently, we see mass murdering all over the place on a consistent basis. We see people dying of starvation. Terrorism is now part of our daily lives. Water contamination, pollution of all the rivers. There's only less than 3% of the water in the earth is drinkable. Do you know that? And there are already conflicts on the earth for access or control of this water. We are going to very soon see wars be carrying out. There are already conflicts. We're going to see wars carrying out for access and control of, of water. We see air pollution consistently also, right? They're trying to do some, but the air that we're breathing is not the air that we're intended to breathe. We see drug abuse, both of illegal and legal drugs, alcohol, all types of things. And we even see the wars that are carried out because of the control and distribution of these drugs. We see violence against women, abuse, physical, phys uh, psychological, sexual abuse of women. We see abuse of children. Every two seconds a child is abused, and five of it, out of every six cases of child abuse is unreported. And we see extreme poverty as things get worse and worse. And people ask themselves, where is God? Now maybe you're here tonight and you've asked yourself the same question. Where is God in all of this? What is God doing? Why is he just sitting back and letting all of this happen as the world continues to get worse and worse and tumble into more and more chaos? I'm going to share with you some questions that people ask me consistently while I do these seminars. And these are some of the questions that they ask. Number one, they ask God, Carlos, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, how can he let all this suffering go on? They ask me, isn't the fact or proof that there's so much pain and suffering, isn't that evidence that God is not all-powerful or that God is not good or that God does not exist? Some people also say, if this is the world that we see, then this must be the world that God created because this is the world that he created. Others say that God, since he is the all-powerful and he created everything, that he is going to have to be, take responsibility for the things that are happening on this earth. And we're going to see tomorrow that God does take certain responsibility for a lot of the things that happen here. Others say that if God, that is God is not all-powerful and he is not all-knowing and that when he simply created the world, after he created it, he just left it alone, right? Like a snowball and he just left it alone and he left it here. And that's a number of different things. And I'm sure that some of you have other questions. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If you have the power of God, if you had the power of God, what would you do? Now, if you had the power of God, I want you to raise your hand. Who would end with gun violence? Raise your hand. Eh, just a few people. Everybody else is pretty comfortable with gun violence, okay? <laughs> if you had the power of God, how many of you would end with poverty? Raise your hand. How many would end with poverty? Yeah, a couple of people. Everybody else is pretty comfortable with extreme poverty and famine, right? That's okay. Now, let's say that this button that I have right here on my hand, right? If I told you that if you push this button right now, you would end with all evil in the world right now. You just have to push this green button and evil would be extinguished from the earth. How many of you would push this button? Most of you. There's some, some people that are comfortable with evil, okay? Now, my question to you is this. Isn't it interesting that the only being in the universe that has the power to press this button to end with evil in a heartbeat? Just like that, he doesn't press the button. And my question to you is, why? Why hasn't God, who has the power to end with evil, why hasn't he pushed that button yet? And the answer to that question is even more fascinating than the question itself. Does everybody want to know why? Psalms chapter 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, 
and in sin my mother conceived me. You see, if God were to push this button and end with evil, in this moment, he would extinguish human beings off the face of the earth. Why? Because where is evil located? Inside each one of us. The Bible says we were born in sin, in iniquity. We are born with this already evilness inside of us. Is everybody there? Now, the question is, what is God waiting because I'm not saying that God is not going to press this button. God is going to press this button. The question is, why hasn't he pressed this button? And what is he waiting to do so? And the answer is also fascinating. We also find it in the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack or late concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient towards us, not willing that what? That any should perish, but that all should come to? I didn't hear an amen for that. God is being patient. God is waiting for you. Amen? That's why. God is going to push this button. God is going to end with this world as we know it. But he's waiting for each one of us. Now, we have two fascinating questions that we're going to answer over the next two nights. Number one is, how can evil exist if God is all-loving and all-powerful? I'm sure that's a question that many people have asked, right? How is it? That God, that evil exists if God is all-loving and all-powerful. We're going to answer that question tonight. Tomorrow night, we're going to answer the second part of this question is that, how does a God of love solve the problem of evil without destroying us? Because we are the objection of God's love. We are the purpose of God's love on this earth. And how is God going to solve this problem of evil that is inside of us without destroying us? Oh, you need to come tomorrow. Amen. Tonight, we're going to touch on the first question. Tomorrow night, we're going to be touching on the second question. Amen? Now, when you go to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, it says God created everything and everything was good. Amen? Everything was perfect. The environment, the relationship between God and his creatures, the relationship between Adam and Eve, the relationship between Adam and Eve and the, and the creatures, and everything was perfect. There was nothing. There was no sin, no depression, no murder, no lying, no stealing, nothing. Everything was perfect. That's what the Bible tells us. But the question is, what happened? If everything was so perfect, and everything was so great, and there was no shadow of sin or anything like that, or evil, what happened? Well, Jesus Christ also explains to us what happened. Everybody with me? Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 43. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed what? Tears among the wheat and went his way. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your fields? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, What? An enemy has done this. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are who? The sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is? Ah... Notice that Jesus Christ through this parable is explaining to us who is the one that sowed or that put in this earth the tares or the bad seed. It is an individual that goes by what? The, the devil. Jesus does not justify it. Jesus does not take responsibility for creating evil or anything like that or God the Father doing it. He says the devil is the one that did this. Now, we have a very interesting idea of who this devil is. So I'm going to do an exercise with you. I want you all to close your eyes. All right? I'll tell you when to close it. Not yet. I want you to close your eyes. And you're going to only going to close it for maybe five seconds tops. Now close it. Everybody close it. I'm looking. And I want you to come up with an image in your mind of who of the devil. Ooh. Some of you are squeaming. Okay, that's enough. I don't want you to think too much about him. Let's leave it there. Open your eyes. All right? Now, now let's see. What did you see? What did you see? Go ahead. Tell me. A beautiful angel. You saw a beautiful angel. What else? Did anybody see anything red? <laughs> right? Anybody see anything red? Very good. Did anybody see a, a tail? Yeah. Right? Did anybody see fangs? Right? Did anybody see a pitchfork? Yeah. Right? The barbecue stick? Did anybody see the pitchfork? Right? Did anybody see something hideous and, and raw? And a monstrous, right? Raise your hand if you saw if you got that imagery of something bad. Maybe some of you thought of something like this, right? This is the concept, the worldly concept that is given of the devil. And you know what? 
This is exactly what the devil wants you to think. The devil wants you to think that he's this big, ugly monster that is coming at you and he's going to eat you up because if you see something ugly and monstrous and vicious coming at you, what are you going to do? You're going to run away, right? That's exactly what the devil wants the world, and that is the concept that the world has given us. And you know where this comes from? It doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from what? From Greek mythology. All right? This is a number of different ones. You can call them Hades or Platon in Spanish or a number of Greek and not only Greek, the other pagan mythologies of this concept of the devil, right? There's the pitchfork because, you know, when you're in hell, you need to make sure you're cooked correctly so you don't, you're not burned on one side and too burnt on the other side, right? This, all this imagery that we have, it all comes from pagan mythology. Fascinating. We're going to be looking into a lot of pagan. It would be something more like this. This is what we would have. Now, it's impossible in human mind to come up with the imagery of what he would look like. But the Bible gives us enough information about this devil to know exactly who he is and what happened to him. Amen? I want you to go with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. If you open your Bible halfway, oh, I forgot to mention, please... Remember your Bible studies. Turn them in, right? Rip off the last page. Turn them in. Don't, get, don't fall too behind in them. So you can get your, uh, your Amazing Facts Bible certificate. If you open your Bibles halfway, you'll find the book of Psalms. And if you go about eight books down to your right, you will run into the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel is a fascinating book right before the book of Daniel. And I want you to go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28 talks to us about this fascinating being known as the devil or Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28. Is everybody there? There are Bibles. I think there are Bibles there in your pews. If anybody needs a Bible, please raise your hand and we will gladly find one for you. Ezekiel chapter 28. And we're going to start on verse 12. Amen? Everybody has a Bible? Everybody has a sword. It says there, Son of man, lift up the lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, this says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond. We'll jump to verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers... I establish you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, what? Until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your training, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was filled, lifted up because of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst, and I devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Amen? This is a description of who? This is a description of this covering cherub. This is the description of this being called Lucifer. And if you notice the description, it doesn't say that he had big fans and he was ugly and he was uh, horrible and he, had, and he was coming out to eat everybody. It says that he was what? He was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and beauty, perfect. It says that he was, uh, uh, in, uh, in every way you were created perfect. It says that he was probably, we cannot argue, we can infer out of the Bible, that Lucifer is the greatest of all created beings, right? Most powerful, most beautiful, most wise, amazing, but it says, until what was found in him. Until iniquity or sin was found in him. Are you with me? Now, it's interesting because amongst all the descriptions that it gives about him, if you know that is a prophecy, Amongst the description, it also says that he is a covering what? Cherub. Covering cherub. Now, to understand and better know what exactly or where Lucifer was and what he was doing in heaven, that covering cherub gives us a lot of information. Is there any place in the Bible where we hear about a covering cherub? Yes or no? In the, 
in the sanctuary. Amen? In the sanctuary, we are spoken about these covering cherubs. Let's take a look. Now, some people say, sanctuary, that Moses, that's Old Testament. Remember what I told you yesterday? That concept of Old and New Testament, take it out of your mind. There's only one testament, the testament of Jesus Christ, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Amen? Now, let's go and let's look inside of this covering cherub so we can get a better idea exactly who Lucifer was. It says Exodus chapter 25, verse 10 to 22. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, and you shall make the two cherub of gold. Make one cherub at one end, and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it, one piece with the mercy seat. Continues to say, And the cherub shall stretch out their wings above covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherub shall be towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherub, which are on the ark of the testimony. Amen? Now, this is all sanctuary language, and this is happening in the sanctuary. There is a place called the Holy of Holies. And inside of the Holy of Holies, we're going to see that as we talk later on, the high priest would come in once a year, and in that place, there was something known as the Ark of the Covenant. I'm sure you've heard of that before. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels that were standing there with their wings stretched out, right? And it says in between those two angels, there was something called a mercy seat. Ooh, we're going to see why it's called the mercy seat. And it's actually representing the throne of God. And there then God says, between those two angels, over the ark, I will come and I will meet with you and I will give you instructions. Now I have a question for you. Was this place very, very important? Was this piece of furniture very important for the nation of Israel? Oh yes, why? Because God says, I'm going to show myself through there and I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to tell you the things you need to do. So this is a very important place, amen? And those two angels or those two cherubs were there. Now I have a question. What is inside of the ark that's so important? Right? Well, let's let the Bible tell us what's inside the ark. Exodus chapter 31 verse 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Zion, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with what? With the finger of? With the finger of God. Verse Exodus 40, 20. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the mercy seat on top of the ark and he brought the ark into the tabernacle, hung up the veil of the covering. Fascinating. Now, what does this represent? This mercy seat, this ark, all of this. It represents the throne of God. Remember we said yesterday that this earthly sanctuary was a model that God told Moses to create because he wanted to show the nation of Israel, he wanted to show his people what? He wanted to show his people a model of the true tabernacle or the true sanctuary that's where? In heaven. Amen? Now, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah says, verse 1 through 7, he says, And I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah has a vision into the heavenly sanctuary, and guess what he sees? He sees those two angels standing, and guess who he sees in between those angels? He sees the throne of God. Amen? So that earthly sanctuary and that earthly Ark of the Covenant and those angels that were created was a what? It was a model of the true throne of God in heaven. Can I hear an amen? So that's what Isaiah actually saw. Now, interestingly, if God's throne was there and he was standing, sitting between these two angels, what is under the throne of God? The testimony are the Ten Commandments. You know what it's saying us? The foundation of God's government, the foundation of God's kingdom, the foundation of God's throne is on what? Is based on his law. Woo! Now I have a question. What happens if you just want to all of a sudden erase all the laws in this country? What would happen? Total chaos and anarchy, right? So it's interesting that some people will run and say, well, just do away with the law. We don't need the law. Yeah? Well, the Bible teaches us that the law is the foundation of God's kingdom and his government. Because a king reigns his kingdom from his throne. Is everybody with me? 
Fascinating stuff. Now, when we go back to Lucifer, and we go back to this, this is the imagery that we're seeing that God is trying to show us into the heavenly sanctuary in heaven and trying to show us that that is his throne. So if Lucifer was one of those covering cherubs, then guess what Lucifer was? Where was he? He was right standing right next to the throne of God. He was at the highest position, the most elevated of all beings, of all creatures. He was standing right there in the throne of God because it says he was one of those covering cherubs. Now, the word Lucifer means light bearer, or in Spanish, I like it better, it's light carrier. And the Bible tells us that light is knowledge. So what was Lucifer's job if he was standing right next to the throne of God, if he was one of those angels? It was to do what? It was to take the knowledge or the character of God to the rest of the angels and the rest of the universe because he had that close, intimate relationship with God the Father and he would take it to the world. Amen? Fascinating stuff. This is where he was. He was right there. There was no higher position for any created being than what Lucifer had. But what happened? What does it say there? Until iniquity was found where? The Bible teaches us that iniquity or sin is a mystery. But the Bible gives us enough information to understand and know that it appeared. That Hebrew word matasa, which means that until it existed, it appeared, it came forth inside of Lucifer. God did not create the devil. God created Lucifer, this beautiful, majestic, smart, more powerful, more intelligent being called Lucifer as the light bearer, the main one. That was there with him. But what happened? It says what? His heart was filled. He looked at himself. I'm so beautiful. I'm so majestic. I'm so powerful. Look at me. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 gives us a little bit more insight into it. Isaiah is about four books before Ezekiel. Isaiah chapter 14 gives us a little bit more insight into the mind of Lucifer. Isaiah chapter 14, and we are going to start at verse 4, 12. Remember, perfect angel. He was perfect, intelligent, the most beautiful, the most exalted of all created beings. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Is everybody there? How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What is Isaiah saying? How is it possible, Lucifer? How is it possible that you are the greatest of all God's creation? How is it possible that there is no more powerful, no more beautiful, no more majestic? There is no other being more intelligent than you. How is it possible that you have fallen? How is it possible? That's the question Isaiah is asking. He says, how? You are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like... Who? Are you... Is everybody getting what we're looking at? What was Lucifer's problem? The I problem. The me problem. I, 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 I will ascend, I will do this, I will sit. Do you think he wanted to be like the Most High? No. He didn't want to be like the Most High. He wanted to be the Most High. He coveted God's throne. He coveted the worship that belonged to God. He desired to be worshipped. His power, his authority. He desired all of these things. If the throne is from the place where the king reigns, Lucifer wanted God's throne. And that's what he desired. Is everybody with me? Woo! What did Lucifer say? Lucifer believed he had a better plan. Lucifer believed he had a better idea for government. Lucifer believed he had better laws. Lucifer believed that he could provide things to God's creation better than the Creator could. He thought he had a better idea. Now, conclusion. To close with this first part regarding Lucifer. The origin of evil began in the mind of Lucifer and continued with his rebellion trying to overthrow God's throne or God's kingdom. Lucifer desired the worship that belonged to God as creator of the universe and persuaded other angels to follow in his rebellion. Is everybody with me? Is everybody with me? Fascinating stuff what we're looking at, amen? Now, the question is, 
How did he carry out his rebellion? We know where it started. We know where the origin of evil was. Inside of Lucifer it began. And the question is, how then did it spread? Because there are a lot of crazy people out there. And really crazy people aren't necessarily the problem. It's the people that follow those crazy people, right? So the question is, how did he take? How was he able to gather up his rebellion in heaven? Now, go with me please to Revelation chapter 12. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. This is a chapter that we are going to be studying in depth as we continue to move along in this seminar. Revelation chapter 12 gives us an insight into the things that are happening. Revelation chapter 12. Is everybody having fun? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I love this stuff. I can do this all night long. If you want to stay, we'll keep on going. Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to start on verse number 7. Everybody there? Revelation 12, 7 says, And war broke out in Afghanistan. Did I read it wrong? And war broke out in Africa. No. And war broke out where? Now, the last place you would expect war to break out is in heaven. But that's what Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 says. It says, And war broke out in heaven. 12:7. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now, hmm, the dragon. Well, you know what? The dragon, I read a book that said that the dragon is China, and that China's going to come down, and then they're going to come up together with Russia, and then this great big war is, is going to... I have a question. Who is the dragon in the Bible? Let's let the Bible ask. Verse number 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called who? The devil and Satan, who deceives some of the world. Oh, we talked about this last night. The deception is a worldwide deception. And if you're saying and sitting there tonight saying, I'm not deceived, you're in right the right place to get deceived. Because a person that is deceived does not know they're being deceived. Amen? How do we know whether we are going to be are deceived or not? We have to continue to study because Revelation is going to decode the enemy's plans in the end times. Is everybody with me? And most of this has already been fulfilled. Ooh. It says, he was cast to the earth and his what? His angels were cast out with him. So not only was he cast out, but he also cast out who? Angels with him. Go with me, please, to verse number four. And it says in verse number four, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw, them, and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give what? Now, we have a problem. There's a war in heaven. And it's not just Lucifer. It says that his tail, he dragged along one third of the angels of heaven. Now, are we understanding this? I want you to understand this. There are billions and billions and billions of angels. The Bible says that Lucifer was able to what? To amount one-third of the billions of angels in heaven to follow his government plans, to follow his ideas, to follow his laws. Beautiful, perfect, majestic angels in heaven. One-third of them. Who are we to stand in front of the devil? Nobody. He convinced one-third of the angels in heaven that he had a better place for them and a better idea than what God had given them. Whoo! Terrible is this. Now that word for war is interesting. Is the Greek word polemos, which is where we get the word polemics or politics. Ooh. So it wasn't a physical war. There are physical elements to this war, but it is really a war of what? Of ideas. That's what the war is about. It's the war of ideas, and it's a war that is being carried out, not in a physical sense, but in a what? in the minds and the hearts of the angels and of the earth. Is everybody with me? Everybody with all of me? Very good. Now, how did Lucifer convince one-third of the angels? This is the question that we have. How did Lucifer convince? How was he able to take one-third of the angels in heaven and show them and convince them that he had a better idea than God? Well, we don't have to go too far. The Bible explains it very clearly. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of... Heaven. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15. The prophet who tells lies, teaches lies is the? Oh, so what is one of the methods that he was using? Lies. But that's not all. Look at what it says in Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 16. We read, by the abundance of your 
training. The Hebrew word is rakal. You become filled with violence within and you sinned. Now, that word trading is a bit confusing if you look at it off the top of the head. But I looked at that same word in other Bible verses and it became very clear. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 16. You shall not go about as a tale bearer or as the one that tells tales. The Greek word is rakal, the same word. And that word means slander or to gossip. So, what were the two strategies that Lucifer did to convince these perfect angels in heaven that never had heard a lie or never heard anything bad? He used lies and gossip. Ooh, gossip is the work of the devil. Now, the question is, what were these lies or this gossip that he was spreading around in heaven that convinced one-third? He began to defame God's character. He began to say that God was selfish, as we're going to see in a minute. He began to say that God was unjust, that God was cruel, that God was a liar, that God was corrupt, that God blackmailed his creation. And you're like, what? What does it say that in the Bible? Did you read the story of Job? What happened in Job? God's, the devil says, oh, have, God says, have you seen my son Job? And what does the devil say? Psst, he only worships you and obeys you because what? Because you blackmail him. Because you protect him and you give him all these blessings. Take your blessings away. Take your protection away. And he will blaspheme you. What is he saying? You're blackmailing him. That's the only reason he's, he, he, he honors you. Is everybody with me? The devil began to defame God's character. Fascinating that in the book of Job, it's not about Job. The book of Job is about God's character. And that's what the devil is at work, defaming who God is in front of the world. And now, interesting, not only God is in conflict with his own creation. Maybe some of you, I don't know, you have children, and sometimes your children will get with a little bit of attitude, and you look at them like, who are you? I brought you to this earth, and I will put you back into it. That's what my mother used to tell me, right? Look at this. What are you? A little two-year-old telling me something like this. Well, that's the issue that God is having. God is in conflict with his own creation. God's character is on trial. Is everybody with me? Now, the question people ask me is, why didn't God just destroy Lucifer? Why did he just and blow him up and destroy him in that very moment? And the question I have for you is, by destroying Lucifer, would that have ended the accusation or the lies or the gossip that had been planted in the minds of the other angels? No. Instead of ending it, it would have only strengthened the accusation. Is everybody with me? I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say the reporters from PBS NewsHour, very respected, very credible news agency in the United States, right? Uh, I forget their names, uh, Gwen Eiffel and the, uh, the other lady. Let's say that all of a sudden they came up at 6 o'clock and they said, United States of America, we have evidence, we have proof that President Barack Obama is involved in money laundering, in drugs, in prostitution, in all these accusations. And they say at 7 o'clock tonight, we are going to present all of this information to the world, to the United States. So everybody goes, woo! Everybody gets excited, right? Everybody's moving around, everybody's getting ready, and everybody's on 7 o'clock and turns on PBS. And when you turn on PBS at 7 o'clock, they come out and they say, we're sorry to say that Gwen Eiffel has been assassinated. Hmm. Now, two things are going to happen. You're going to be like, well, looks like Gwen Eiffel knew something. And she was what? Taken out. Right? Did the accusations that she make at 6 o'clock, did they end there? No, they were strengthened because it looked like, looks like she had something on President Barack Obama and they had to take her out. Amen? So by destroying Lucifer, you're not solving the problem because the idea has already been planted in the minds. Is everybody with me? And the second thing is, if that would have been the case, then the angels would have said, Whoa, oh, we better not get on God's wrong side because if not, and then the angels would begin to obey God out of fear instead of obeying him out of love. Everybody with me? Oh, this is getting juicy. You thought that... This is fascinating stuff what we see now. I have a question for you. How do you discredit or how do you trample on an idea or a false accusation? By disproving that accusation or presenting a 
better idea. This is politics. I have a better idea of government than this person does, right? And they try to persuade you. This is what this war in heaven is. The devil is trying to persuade, and he convinced one-third. And now God is saying, well, now we have an issue. By destroying Lucifer, nothing is solved. The total opposite. So what does God do? He says, this is the plan of government that you have. This is your idea. Okay, you know what? I'm going to let you carry out your plan. And I'm going to show the world and at through time, the true character of your accusation and who you truly are and who I truly am is going to flourish at the end of this conflict. Is everybody with me? So God permits this to go on. Why? Not because he wants pain and suffering, but he is God of love and he has given each one. And the rebellion of Lucifer is perfect proof that every single being that God has ever created it has free will. That is perfect evidence because the greatest creation, the greatest thing that he ever created in the sense of Lucifer, that majestic being rebelled and God did it. Is everybody with me? Amen? Now, the human family is found. We're caught up in between this cosmic conflict, in between this great controversy. And the question is how? This didn't start on earth. It started in heaven. How did we end up in all this? Why are we dealing with all of this, right? Well, the solution to that is found in the book of Genesis. If you had to ask me, Carlos, what is the most, imp just one chapter in the Bible, what is the most important chapter in the Bible? I would tell you it's Genesis chapter 3. What? Genesis chapter 3 is full of everything. It's juicy. We're going to be touching on Genesis chapter 3 for the next couple of nights and really further on. Because it has the plan of salvation in it. Amen? Go with me, please, to Genesis chapter 3. Go with me, please, to Genesis chapter 3. Now, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created and everything was perfect. Everything was good. God created the, not the, the first day. Everything was great. But in chapter 3, something happened. Something fascinating happens in chapter 3. Amen? It says, everybody there? It's very, uh, not hard to find. Genesis chapter 3 is the chapter, is the first book of the Bible. It says, now the, who? Who's the serpent? Revelation 12 7, and 9 said what? The old ser serpent of old. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what God told her? No, he didn't even tell her. He told her husband. Right? Hmm. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you what? Did God say that? Not completely, right? What is the devil doing? He's twisting God's word. That's what he does to perfection. Remember we read a verse yesterday that said that the unstable and untaught, what do they do? They twist the word of God. When Jesus went, came out of the desert, what did the devil do? The three temptations was what? Through the word, right? He twisted the word of God just enough. And how did Jesus contra attack or put his fight up against the devil's false accusations and false and, and twisting of the word? He used what? Scripture. What is it trying to tell us? We need to know our Bible if we are going to be prepared to attack and to defend ourselves against the enemy. Are you with me? You need to know your Bible because the devil, who is the most cunning of all and the most deceitful of all, who convinced one-third of the angels in heaven that he had better plans, this is what he uses to deceive Christians. Ooh, we need to know our Bibles. Amen? Continues to say, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not what? Surely die. Is not the devil saying that God is a liar? God said you shall die. And what is he saying? You're not going to die. What is he saying? God lied to you. Isn't that what he's saying? God lied to you. That's not true. Let's continue to read. It says, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be what? Will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what is the devil saying? God is lying to you. And not only is he lying to you, he's hiding something from you. He lied to you about the tree because if what happens is if you eat of the tree, you will be like God. And that's why he doesn't want you because he doesn't want competition. That's what he's telling them, right? 
So I'm sure Eve's brain is just going all over the place, right? There's a serpent that's talking to me. She's saying that I've eaten it. He's talking. I mean, if I eat it, what's going to happen to me? He's just a serpent. So all of these things are happening, and the devil is really playing a mind game in her. Are you with me? Now, God puts this tree. Now, I want you to look at this tree as something very simple. The tree is really a voting, a voting booth. A what? It's a voting booth. For example, when you have elections, whether it be local or, or countrywide, right? You go into the booth and you mark who you want to govern in whatever uh, office that is being posted, right? God put this tree, and he said, the day that you eat of it, you shall be like God, knowing good and evil, told her the serpent. Now, what does it mean, knowing good and evil? I struggle with that word for a lot, and I would ask a lot of people, what does it mean that you shall be like God, knowing good and evil? And I really got really back and forth. But you know how I solved the problem? Because I couldn't find a really concrete answer. I went back to the original language. I went back to the Hebrew. And the word that shows up where it says knowing is the word jada. And you know what jada means? It does mean knowing, but it also means declaring or to determine. So when the devil told her, if you eat of that tree, you shall be like God. What does it mean to be like God? To determine or declare what's right and wrong. Is everybody with me? Who is the only one that determines what's right or wrong? God. So what were the Adam and Eve do on the day that they decided to eat of this tree? This is what they were saying. God, thank you for creating me. Thank you for creating this beautiful wife. Thank you for creating this beautiful husband. Thank you for giving us the earth. Thank you for everything that you've done. But from this moment on, we do not need you as God to tell us what is right or wrong. We are going to determine and declare from now on what is right and wrong. And that's the sin that they did. They wanted to do what? The devil wanted to be in God's place. He wanted to be in his throne. But because he couldn't, what does he do? He makes humans try to think that they can sit on the throne of God declaring right from wrong. Is everybody with me? Now, did they or did they not disobey? Yes, they did. What does it say in verse number 6? Verse number six says, so when the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Whew. Now they have disobeyed. They have said. Now I have a question for you. What did God do when Adam and Eve disobeyed? Did he strap on them like a cockroach and destroy them? No, he did not. You know what he did? When they said, God, thank you for all you have done. And I want to make this point because this is what we're seeing in the world today. It's called the theory of relativism. Oh, it doesn't matter. You know, you do what you think is right and I'll do what I think is right. And everybody, let's just, you know, it's all good. We're all right. That's not what the Bible says. When they took the determination, we don't need you, God, to tell me what's right or wrong. You know what God did when they made that decision? He respected their decision. And he stepped aside. But here's the problem. When you choose to disobey God's word, when you choose to not follow God's word, God respects your decision because God is a God of love. But when you choose that, God is going to step aside, not because he wants to, but because you have asked him to do so. And when you do that, the problem is that not only does God step aside, but so does his protection and his blessings. And if you disobey God, knowingly disobey God and say, thank you, but I want to do my own thing, God will step aside. And if God is not protecting you anymore, guess in who hands you're in. Oh, are you following me? God respected their decision. He said, if that's your desire, children, I will let it. And what was the result of this disobedience? Romans chapter 5, 12 and 6, 23. Therefore, just as, the, as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, for the wages of sin is what? The virus of me, the virus of I that Lucifer had now came inside and corrupted the human mind. Now Adam and Eve were what? They were thinking like the enemy. They were thinking, I, me. And notice something. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments have nothing to do with me. The Ten Commandments has to do with who? The first table has to do with God. The second table has to do with all of you. 
with each other. There is no selfishness in God's kingdom. Amen? But this is what happened. The virus of selfishness entered into the human experience, and it now became part of their life. That it was their, their character was distorted, and now they had the virus or the cancer of me inside of them. Is that, are you following me? And that's how this world came about. It says Romans 6.16, 6, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are the ones slaves whom you obey? Who did Adam and Eve obey? The devil. Right? They had a choice. God gives them the freedom to choose. But they chose to obey the devil. And the Bible says that because they obeyed the devil, guess who did they become slaves to? The devil. And by that, God had given Adam and Eve this world. Oh, you got to come on Monday. Woo! When we talk about the ascension of Christ. God had given Adam and Eve the world, but by through obedience, them being king and queen of this world, they gave it over to the devil. And that's how this world came about. And that's why it says in John 14, 30, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing on me. Jesus Christ is saying who? The ruler. We're going to see on tomorrow and on Monday how the kingship was taken away from the devil. We're going to jump up in joy with that one. Amen? But he was. The Bible teaches that he was the king. And this earth which was beautiful, perfect, with no, no, no mistake, no sin, no death, nothing, all of a sudden turned into what we are looking at today. This is the world that we are living in today. A world that has said what? Thank you, God. You know, not even thank you. You know, just step aside and we don't need you anymore. We don't need your law. We don't need your word. We human beings can determine and declare what's right and wrong. We don't need you to tell us. And this is the world that we live in. Is everybody following me? This is the world that we are in. A world that has rejected God's word. Is everybody with me? Amen. Now, it says here, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God has love. Ah, it doesn't say that God has love. It says that God is love. Amen? And the essence of love, guess what, is freedom. The proof that God loves us so much is that he has given us the freedom to choose. He does not force his will on any of us. I was married three months ago, and I thank the Lord that when I asked my wife to marry me, she said yes, not because she had a gun pointed in the back of her head, but because she loves me. Amen? That was her free choice. And that's how God reigns this universe. He reigns it with love, out of freedom. He could have created machines and monsters and rocks and stones to obey him, and just everybody went... Just computers. But that's not God. God is a God of love, and love needs to be shared. God needs to share love with somebody, and that's why God created. Why do you have children? Why? Oh, I don't just woke up one day and want to have kids. No, there's some natural instinct in us that want to have kids. Why? Because we are loving beings, and we need to spread our love and our seed and grow. Is everybody with me? Now, I can give you a perfect example of this. Let's say all of a sudden we're standing here, and all of a sudden walking through those doors come two gunmen. Right? And they have AK-47s, and they say, stand up, get against the wall. What are you going to do? I don't know about you, but I'm going to get against the wall. Right? And then they say, all right, now, take out everything that you have in your pockets, your cell phones, your wallets. What are you going to do? I don't know about you, but I'm going to take everything out. You'll almost do almost, almost anything, right? But let's say this person, this gunman, took an AK-47 and pointed it right between your eyes and looked at you and said, now I want you to love me. Why are you laughing? Can you love somebody like that? No. You can't force love. Love is not forced. The devil forces himself on the lives. God persuades you. God oozes you. God wins you over with love. And tomorrow, we are going to see the greatest persuasion of all times. How did God win over the human race to show who he was? Amen? Now, God has all the power in the world to force, to create his beings, to obey, and even to appoint worship. But God cannot force any being in this world to love him. Why? Because God is 
love. And it's a free choice that God gives to every one of his beings. Is everybody with me? Now, the devil has a number of methods that he uses to deceive human beings amongst us. And there's one in particular that's fascinating. I'm going to send you this in my email. <coughs> I'm going to send you this in my email, but there's one here. Today the enemy tricks us, and he, as he did Eve, telling you what? You can know, you can declare, you can determine what's right or wrong. In other words, he says what? Follow your heart. Have you ever heard this, right? All the songs that you listen to. I've gone to Christian churches, and what is the, I hear them saying, just follow your heart. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. That's what they say, right? Now I have a question. If following your heart was the answer to the problems in this world, then this world should be better. But it's the total opposite. This world is much worse. Because you know what? Following your heart, follow your feelings. How do you feel inside? That's not the key. That's not what God is showing us. You know why? Because the heart is deceitful. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. What does God say? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it i the lord search the heart and i test what and i test the mind god is trying to tell us don't follow your heart your heart is wicked your heart is perverse you were born with the cancer or the virus of me of i this selfishness sin at the bottom line is selfishness and God is saying, don't follow your heart because you are born selfish. He says, make your heart follow my word. This is the guiding. This is the light and the lamp at your feet. You make sure that what you're doing is following this, not following this. Because this is deceitful. Everybody with me? Make sure I know your heart. I know who you are because I created you. And I want you to follow what I say, not what you think is good or what you feel is good but what i tell you because you don't know your way is everybody with me fascinating stuff what we're looking at is that can i hear an amen now after the devil has rebelled after he's rebelled and he's carried out at first he attacks the church he just brings pain on the church but it doesn't work he's consistently throughout and we're going to look at that as we, when we study on on monday the 144,000 in the history of the nation of israel he continually brings pain and pain and pain and pain and pain but he notices that it doesn't work because the more pain he brings the more christians and more god's people pop up so he says i'm going to change my strategy and guess what he does instead of attacking the church now he infiltrates the church. And he says, I can do more damage from the inside. Is everybody with me? And he changes his, just to attack the church. Because there are some people that will break when they attack. When they're attacked. But what he does is he deceives from inside of the church. And he starts to use this beast in Revelation chapter 13. Go with me please. Woo! Are you having fun? All right. I remember, if you want to say amen, go ahead and say it. I have no problem. I actually need a little amen once in a while. I know that your, your, your heartbeat is going. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Revelation 13, verse 1 says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a what? A beast risen up of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now, yesterday we started to talk about this. Is this some scene from Godzilla or from some movie of Hollywood where this beast is coming out of the water rawr, with ten heads and he's trying to attack and eat everybody? Is that what the Bible is talking about? No, right? What did we say yesterday? What does the Bible say it represents a beast in Bible prophecy? A kingdom or a nation, right? Oh, you guys are good. That was just one first class. Praise the Lord. A kingdom or a nation that rises up amongst the sea. What did we see the sea or waters or rivers represent in Bible prophecy? People, multitudes, nations. So there is a kingdom that is going to be risen up in the end times from amongst the people, nation, tribes, and kingdoms of this world. And it is going to have what? Seven heads. What are seven heads? Who remembers? Seven mountains, geography, praise the Lord. And it says it has ten horns and ten crowns. If it has a crown, that means it has what? Monarchies, right? Crowns, ten crowns, ten horns. And we saw, we're going to see that those ten horns are ten kings. This is a history lesson. Praise the Lord. Amen? 
continues to say, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, throne, and great authority. Oh, so China's going to come, and China's going to give the power to this other nation. No. Who is the dragon? The devil. So my question to you is, who is behind this kingdom that is going to be risen up in the end times? The devil. Who continues to say, verse number three, And I saw one of his heads as it had been wounded, mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world, what? Marveled and followed the beast. How much of the world? I want you to understand something. The whole world is following this kingdom. The whole world. This is not a regional, oh, this is only in, in, in Western Africa, or this is only in Latin America. No, this is the whole world is being deceived through this kingdom or this nation that the devil is going to rise up. And I'm sorry, but I already said, and we're going to show it historically and biblically, that this nation is already standing on this earth right now. Woo, there you go. It says, so they worshiped. Who worshiped? The whole world. The whole world that was marveling at the beast, it says here, they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him. So by worshiping or obeying the beast or this nation, who are they really worshiping or obeying? The devil. You want to see something even more fascinating? Ooh, this gets better. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 and 25 says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth and shall devour some of the earth everybody shall persecute the saints of the most high and shall intend to change times and the bible is warning us that this beast or this nation or this kingdom that is rising up in the end times is going to what He's going to try to change the times and law of God. I have a question. Wasn't that Lucifer's job? Wasn't he supposed to be taking God's knowledge and wisdom? And he was right there in front of the throne with the, with the law as the foundation. And he rebelled against God's law. He took Adam and Eve to rebel against God's law. And now the devil is using this nation in the end times to do what? To rebel against God's law. Nothing is changing. The devil is doing what? He's, he's using the church. This is what he is doing. He's trying to play around. Since he couldn't ca carry out his ways, he's now trying to make human beings do the same thing. Woo! This is getting fun. Uh, is it getting fun? <laughs> this is getting awesome. Can I hear an amen? amen? Let's continue to read. It says, talking about this beast, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against what? God to blaspheme his name and his what? His tabernacle. You know why when I speak about the sanctuary, when I go around the country and other places and I speak about the heavenly sanctuary, some people go, there's a sanctuary in heaven? What, do you do? what does that have to do? People aren't aware. You know why? You know why you're not aware and why it is not being studied more deeply as we're going to do here? We're going to study the sanctuary in an amazing way. Not the earthly sanctuary. That's the model. We're going to be studying the heavenly sanctuary. You know why more Christians are not aware of this? Because the devil has trampled on the sanctuary. He doesn't want to know. He doesn't want his, God's children to know what they have to do in the end times to walk away from the deceptions of the devil. I can't hear an amen for that. Praise the Lord. But we're here. What are we doing here? We're opening it up. Amen? We're going to study the sanctuary. Tomorrow night is the introductory topic to the sanctuary. And you are going to be blown. You need to come tomorrow. Amen? Oof, fascinating stuff. And it continues to say, I was on verse number 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over some tribes, some tongues, and some nations. Every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. This is a worldwide deception through this kingdom. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. How many? All will dwell on the earth shall worship him. Whose name has not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Well, I don't know about you, but if I need my book written in the name of the book of life, amen? 
How do we do that? Keep on coming. We're going to have a topic about that. Amen? And it continues to say, verse 11, look at this. Then I saw a, another beast. Another what? Another beast, which is another kingdom or another nation. Another nation coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So a second nation is going to rise up and do what? Work with this first beast. Now there are two beasts. Oh, you thought things were getting hard. There are two beasts. And I'm going to tell you another thing. Both of these beasts or both of these nations are standing on the earth right now. But they're not together yet. This is telling us when they are going to unite. We're going to see all of this being fulfilled right before our very eyes. You need to keep on coming. Amen? He performs great signs so that he even makes the fir fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make a what? An image of the beast who was grounded by the sword and lived. He was grounded, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Persecution. If you don't follow this false system of worship that is going to be established by these two beasts, guess what? You are going to be killed. If you don't worship the image of the beast, you are going to be killed. He causes all, how many? All, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is six, six. Six. I want you to understand something. 666 is not the mark of the beast. 666, it says here, is the number of the name of the beast. Amen? The beast has a name, and that name is found in 666. Is everybody with me? Now, this is, you thought Hollywood come, came up with come very interesting story plays. There is nothing like what we're reading and studying here. Amen? This is the things that are happening in the end times. And as I said, these two nations, these two powers are coming together. And they are going to impose a false system of worship on the whole world. And guess what the whole world is going to do? They are not going to rebel against the system. They are going to what? They are going to follow the system. Everybody in the world. That's what prophecy says, and through this seminar, we're going to prove every single point. I promise you that if you come here every night, and you study with us, and you go through your Bible studies, and you pay attention, by the end of this seminar, that chapter which we read, you'll be able to read it and decode it in, like if you were reading something in English. That's how fascinating this is, and it's all in the Bible, amen? Now, I don't want you to go home now and get scared, right? Oh, what's coming? Let's go get, let's go to Walmart and let's go pack up on food. And no, 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 no. Don't do any of that. Because why? We don't have to be afraid of any of this because, because the enemy is already a defeated enemy. Amen? The Bible has already shown us that we have nothing to fear if we are in Christ. It says in Ezekiel 28, 19, what is going to happen to the enemy, this devil? It says, therefore I brought you fire from your midst. It devoured you and I what? I turned you into what? into ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Can I hear an amen? The Bible teaches us that the devil is going to be what? Turned into ashes. It says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 that inasmuch that as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, talking about Christ, likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is who? I can't hear an amen for that. This says the devil is going to be destroyed. Amen? It says here in Romans chapter 16, 20, And the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet when? Shortly, very shortly. Can I hear an amen? Revelation 20, 10. What about that beast? What is going to happen with the beast? Well, the Bible says the devil was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast or that nation and the false prophet, which we are going to see is the second beast, are thrown into. There's that lake of fire. Can I hear an amen for that? And you know what the best part of this is? 
is that after this is done with, when the devil is done away with, the Bible promises us that affliction will not rise up a second time. Amen? This world that we're seeing is a world that has given themselves over to the enemy, not knowingly, but willingly because they have rejected God. And this is the world that we live in. Now, while the devil is not the king of this earth anymore, and we will see that in upcoming uh, topics, the devil is still sitting on the throne of the hearts of most people in this world, and this world that we live in is proof of it. Most people have rejected God, and without knowing that, by not wanting Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of your heart, you have accepted, or they have accepted the enemy as the one that is sitting on their throne, and that's who they are following. Amen? But that does not have to be the case, because the Bible tells us that the enemy is done with. He knows that his time is up. He knows that he is defeated. It's a matter not of him knowing it. It's a matter of you knowing that you have the victory accessible to you through Jesus Christ. Amen? And the Bible promises in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 4, one of my favorite Bible verses. Now I saw a new what? A new heaven and who? Is this a new earth? No, this is the old verse, same old earth. Yeah, I see a new heaven and a new earth. With what? For the first heaven and the earth, earth first earth, what? passed away. And how is that new heaven and that new earth that God is promising where affliction will rise up no more? Where there will be no more cancer or murder or violence or rape or depression or suicide or doctors? None of that is going to be needed. How is that earth going to be? It says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more what? No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more cancer, no more AIDS, no more suffering, no more anything. There will be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Can I hear an amen for that? Praise the Lord. That is the promise that God has in the book of Revelation for all those who love his return. Amen? Woo! And Jesus Christ tells you today, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have what? Peace. In the world you will have tribulation. He's not saying that there's not going to be tribulation and that we're not going to go through a little burning. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. The devil does not have to have power over you. You know why? Because he is defeated. The only power the devil is going to have over you and your household and the people that you love are the ones that you, uh, the power that you give him because he is a defeated enemy. Amen? Can I hear an Amen. Is there anybody here that wants to say, oh, I don't want the devil in my life. I want the devil out. Raise your hand. I know I want him out of my life. Anybody here that wants to say, I have nothing to do. You want the key to victory? Who wants the key to victory? I'm going to give it to you for free because it's in the Bible. Amen? You know what that key to victory is? We find it in James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. And it says, therefore, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Can I hear an amen? The Bible tells us if you want that devil out of your life, if you want him to have no power over you, draw near to me. Get close to me, and as you get close to me, I will put my wings around you, and I will protect you. I will take care of you and your loved ones. Amen? Praise the Lord. That is the promise of the Bible, and that is what God has in store for us. Now, this happened a couple of years ago. In the state of Florida, right? Florida is like, anybody here ever been to Florida? Right? I lived in Florida for a little bit. Right? It's like a big swamp. So, there's this family, right? And the little boy tells his mother, Mom, I want to go out and play with my friends. And the mother says, well, you know, okay, son, be careful, right? Be careful because there are swamps and there are lakes around. Just be very careful. The young boy runs out and starts going to play, and all of a sudden, after a couple of minutes, the mom hears the scream, and you know, as a mother and father, that you know this, you recognize the scream of your children, right? And she ran out of this house, and as she ran out, as she heard what the screaming was, and she saw that, whoo, this crocodile had what? Had his, her son by the leg, and he was doing what? He was dragging him in the water to drown him and eat him. And you know what this mother did? This mother grabbed that young boy by the arms, and this was a big tug and war. And they were going back and forth, and this crocodile was just pulling on this young boy, and this mother would not let go. A neighbor came by, heard the ruckus, and he came out with a shotgun. Boom! Killed the alligator. That young boy was then taken to the hospital. One of these small towns over in the Panhandle in Florida, 
And as the news reporter and the camera and the camera guy come by, they go, you know, have you noticed that this kid in this room, he's smiling. He has a smile on his face from one ear to the other. I'm going to ask him what that's about. He says, yes, please do, because why is he smiling? So when they come to interview the young boy, they say, after they ask him the questions and what happened, they say, you know what? I noticed that you have a big smile on your face. Why are you smiling? I mean, your, your leg has virtually been ripped off. Your scars are all over the place. You're never going to be able to walk like a normal kid again. Why are you smiling? What's so fun about this? And he says, the young boy looked at the, at the report and he says, you know what? The problem is that you're looking at the scars that are on my legs. But you're not looking at the scars that are on my arms and my wrist and my hands. Because my mother never let me go. My mother never let go. Jesus Christ is telling you tonight. The devil may have put off all his tricks. He may have tried to deceive in every single way. And he might have tried to pull humanity out of God's hands. But Jesus Christ is telling you, I love you so much. I never let go. And the proof of that are the scars that are on my hands and on my wrists and on my side and on my feet and on my forehead. Amen. That's the God that I serve. That's the evidence that Jesus Christ has never let us go. And tomorrow night we are going to see what actually happened on the cross of Christ. What is going on? For God so loved the world. It's unconceivable. It's not humanly possible to understand what happened at the cross. It's the greatest love story ever told. Amen? And God is asking you tonight. He says, this is what I've done for you. I've given it all. Now, is there anybody here tonight that wants to say, this is amazing. I see what's happening in the world. I see that God did not create this world. God is letting this go about. But there's going to come a time when God is, once those tares and those wheats fully grow, he's going to end this. And he's going to say, this is the kingdom that the enemy has brought forth. And this is the kingdom that I have for you. Amen? But for that, we have to start today. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus Christ to be the only one sitting on the throne of my heart. Is there anybody here that wants to follow me and join me and say, me too. I only want Christ sitting on, my th on the throne of my heart. Does anybody else want to say it? Stand up. Let's stand up together and let's proclaim it to heaven. Let's, let's let those angels mark this down. I only want Christ sitting on the throne of my heart. I only want to follow the word of God. I don't want to follow anything else because anything else, I can't follow other human beings. I have to only follow the word of God because this is the light, the only lamp that shows us and guides us down the way. Can I hear an amen for that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Tomorrow, we are going to see this carry out in a way that you'll never understand. It's unbelievable what we're going to study tomorrow. But I need you to do something. I need you to... You got to bring somebody else. This is too juicy. This is too delicious. This is a banquet we're having here. Bring somebody else. You know somebody that would benefit from this. And like I said, it doesn't matter if it's been a long, long life Christian. Everybody, we're going to see something tomorrow that you've never seen before. It's going to blow us away. Amen? Tomorrow, we have what? The slayed lamb of Revelation. We're going to see this lamb in Revelation chapter 5. What is going on with the seven horns and the seven eyes? And then we're going to jump into the seven seals. We're just getting started, right? We're like right at the, sh at the, uh, the water just touching your toes. Later on, we're going to be jumping headfirst into the water. Amen? That's what God has for us today. Amen? Remember, as you continue to come... Please pass through a registration and you'll get attendance. Tonight's topic is, did God create the devil? That's the study guide that you're going to take home. Please do the study guides. Maybe you fell behind, you didn't turn the first one in. But bring the one from yesterday and bring it. Even if you have to do one a night, that's okay. Amen? We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you, but bring it in. Now, maybe I spoke too fast. Maybe I got a little too excited. Maybe you're tired, right? Maybe you... There might be a number of things. Maybe you were a little dozing off a little bit, came in one ear, come out the other. You're going to have the study guide that is about this topic. I'm going to send you my notes. Please, if you haven't received anything, give me your email. Not in doctor's letters, but in your letters and print, please, all right? And I could understand it. Just kidding. Just kidding. Please bring them out, and I will send you all my notes, everything. There's much more in there. I can't cover everything, but I'm going to give you my notes. You're going to have the study guide. But there is one promise that I, I never want you to forget when you walk out of the house of God. There is one promise I never want you to forget, despite anything, that God has for you where? In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. And what does it say? Let's read it together. Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. 
I will strengthen you. I will always help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And who is standing at the righteous right hand of the Father? Jesus Christ. Who is the one that upholds you? Who strengthens you? Who walks with you? Who fights for you? Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to ask Pastor Ken to come out here and give us a prayer to end. And I want to thank you all. I'll see you tomorrow. If not, I'm going to go get you at your house. But I want to see you tomorrow. Bring somebody else. Bring a friend. Bring a neighbor. Bring a family member. Thank you for your patience. God bless you. Amen. Now you just bow your heads. Dear Lord, again, we've heard an incredible message right from your word. Your word is sure. Your word is fast. Your word is true. May we learn to rely on your word, not on our feelings. Thank you for loving us so much that you've given us choice. May we determine to make the choice for you to be the Lord of our lives. Thank you for this message tonight. Be with us as we go to our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night. God bless. Have a safe trip home.